after we get through with photoelectric, what was the next thing? What's the lab some of y'all working on now? Uh, yeah, we're doing the, the flow, right? The flow or level control. After we get through with that, uh, then we'll go into uh, temperature sensors. We know what a sensor is now, right? So what's a sensor? We, yeah, so. <laughs> And then these are the ones that we came up with the first of the semester. We already did position. We've done speed. We skipped over guys, uh, because the next lab we do is on temperature. Some of y'all are getting almost through with your uh, lab on uh, on the float switches. So go ahead and skip over and come back to weight later on. Uh, so what we'll do now, we we'll proximity, light sensors, motion. We haven't done weight. Uh, so what we're going to do now is we're going to go ahead and get into temperature. So if you get through with the flow switches, you can go back and uh, you can start working on these. And then we'll come back and pick up uh, weight sensors later. So these are the sensors that uh, we're going to talk about. Hypothetic temperature sensors, thermocouples, RDTs, uh, thermistors, infrared, and then some infrared circuit uh, temperature sensors. So these are what we got to deal with. Depends on where you're at and where you're working on what what scales they use. Uh, most of us are familiar here. Uh, we're using the U.S. customary of Fahrenheit, uh, which says 32 degrees is three. These are all at sea level, by the way. I know when uh, if we go up in altitude, then you you got to have a hotter temperature to boil water, right? In fact, a lot of mountain climbers. They can't boil water because it starts boiling before it even gets warm because they're up so uh, so high. You know, so all these are at, at sea level. So that means wherever you're at, it might not be exactly this. So on the Celsius scale, which used to be called the centigrade scale, but it's been officially changed over. Uh, water freezes at uh, zero degrees uh, Celsius and boils at 100 degrees Celsius. And I don't know why the D's up there. Uh, Fahrenheit, which is what we use over here, water freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit and boils at 212. And then we've got two other scales that you're going to have to deal with as far as temperature uh, sensors go. It's uh, temperature scales that deal with what we call absolute zero. Uh, we have two. We have the Kelvin scale and then we have the Rankin scale. And what's the difference? Well, the spacing on the Reagan scale uses the exact same spacing that we do on the Celsius scale. Uh, and then the Rankin scale uses the same one. It uses the same spacing that the Fahrenheit scale uses. So uh, Fahrenheit from zero degrees Kelvin, of course, absolute zero. Uh, it's, it's been calculated. I don't think it's ever been reached. I'm making research that. But they stay below the temp. We're temp we don't have temperature anymore. We don't have any degrees anymore uh, because zero degrees Kelvin or. or Zero degrees ranking, that's as low as we can go. And they, I think it's been calculated that basically all molecular motion is at its minimum at this temperature. So, uh, of course, uh, in Kelvin, um, uh, zero degrees in Kelvin actually equals 270, minus 273 degrees uh, Celsius and then uh, 459.67 degrees Fahrenheit. So it all depends on where you're working at, which scale they use, and what, what these temperature uh, things are rated off at. We still measure them basically the same. This is just a, 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 a chart that compares the different scales. Uh, so uh, 273 degrees uh, Kelvin would actually be where water freezes. And it's still in the positive range, right? So. Uh, the, the Rankin scale and the Kelvin scale, there's no negatives. It goes from zero and up, right? Understand that. Uh, the Fahrenheit scale and the Celsius scale uh, has a zero, 
but this is the problem. I need to research that and see how they came up with these 32 degrees and 212 degrees uh, for freezing and boiling. Anybody know? It's weird. Um, the Celsius scale makes more sense because it says freezing is what? Zero and boiling is 100. Anybody know how to convert between the Fahrenheit and the Celsius scale? Google this. So here we have 100, and how many marks do we have between 32 and 212? So I take 212, and I'd subtract 32, and that would give me my marks between uh, between uh, freezing and and what would that be? So uh, what we have to do, and the scale is for every nine marks in our Fahrenheit scale, we have five marks in our in our Celsius scale. So it depends on what you're going to do. You're either going to use a nine fifth or you're going to use five ninths. So which way would you do? So if I'm going from Celsius to Fahrenheit, C to F, then I'd use nine fifths. And if I was going from uh, Fahrenheit, uh, I'm sorry, if I was going to Celsius to Fahrenheit, this right. If I was going from Celsius to, this is wrong. Yeah, this would be Fahrenheit to Celsius. Then I'd use five nights. So first of all, we have to set them even to zero. So if I if I had uh, 25 degrees, no, let's don't do that. Let's say I had uh, 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Then the first thing I would do is I would set them even to each other. So I'd say a 75 minus 32, and that would give me what? What's that? 43, and then I'd multiply that by 5 ninths. And some people have those fractions in their head. I don't. Yeah. Which is about right. This is something I, I have in mind because most solid state devices are rated at 25 degrees uh, Celsius, which is around 77 degrees Fahrenheit. So, so let's say I have a uh, let's say I have a uh, Celsius. Uh, let's say I have 52 degrees C. What would that be equal to in Fahrenheit? So how'd you come up with that? Multiply it by what? Five ninths. And then I would come up here and this is Celsius. I'm sorry, nine which one? Nine fifths. Fifty two times nine fifths. What would that give me? And then I would add 32 to it to compensate for zero. So what you do when you're going from uh, from from Fahrenheit to Celsius, you subtract 32 to drop it, drop, drop freezing at the same point, right? Uh, on your Fahrenheit, what you do once you multiply it by nine fifths, you have to do what? To add 32 to bump it up. So that's our two primary scales we have right here. Uh, the problem is, is we understand this. We understand that it's, you know, 21 degrees when I woke up this morning. 
which is well below freezing, but you know, over here it would already, already be minus, right? You understand that? So the first temperature sensor we'll look at is called bimetallic strips. And what we do is we bond two metals together. We use the copper and iron or brass to get steel. And metals expand. Um, when I took a physics class, it was a mechanical physics. And one of the things that we did was measure how much metals expand. Uh, we had a steam chamber that we put uh, the metals in and we exposed it to where we would measure the temperature it is right now, right? And then we had a micrometer on the outside, and when we exposed the rod to, to, uh, to heat, we would see that it would like it would get longer. And then we would calculate the coefficient of the expansion. So different metals, as they expand, they get bigger. If they get colder, they get, uh, they cool down, that's right. And it's very, very, very little, guys. Uh, so what happens when we bond these two metals together? <laughs> and if we put them, uh, if we put them in a straight line, what would happen? It depends on which one has the fastest coefficient of expansion. Uh, but what would happen is we bond them together, and this guy expanded faster than that one. Then this thing would actually do what? It would actually warp. And how much it warps would be, would be would be proportional to the temperature, because these metals expand at a very precise rate. So bimetallic strips. So this is kind of showing you. So here, uh, the red one has a, uh, expands faster than the iron. They got the iron on the bottom, so copper expands faster, and it would warp, right? And how much it warps would be proportional to the what? To the temperature, really accurate. Uh, this is the one we'll see most often. These are called helix, where the bimetallic strip would have. Normally, uh, normally a temperature gauge or something, we're going to want it to move in a arc, right? You understand? Because we can measure those real easy. Uh, we can take the output and hook it up to a, a potentiometer, and then when, the, when it moves, if the potentiometer moves, it'll give me a voltage that's proportional to the temperature. Uh, so uh, I don't know if I've still got this in here or not. But this is the way uh, my, uh, oh, here it is. this is uh, before we had digital thermometers and started using electronic devices. Uh, we literally used bimetallic strips to control our HVAC system. And uh, by the way, don't drop this because it's got a mercury switch on it. So this is an old uh, thermostat unit that came off of uh so what we're doing is here's the bimetallic strip right here, and then it's wound. And what we do is we either put more tension on it or less tension on it against the calibrated spring. And when it tries to move, uh, the calibrated spring is either going to make it move slower or make it move faster. And then what we had is we had a, a therm we had a, a we had a mercury switch up here. Now, I know mercury is a metal. It's a, it's a pretty good conductor, but mercury has an extremely low melting temperature. So by the, when we usually see mercury, it's already warm. It's already melted. And so what happens is you can actually see the little prongs here, and then when the mercury goes over, it, it, it covers them up, which could, creates a circuit. And we use these things for years until they found out why. Yeah, mercury bad. <laughs> uh, mercury, the, the the problem we have with mercury is it's a car carcinogen, which means it causes brain damage. But the problem we have is the molecules of mercury are so small they'll actually go through your skin. So mercury is extremely dangerous to handle. You know what I mean? And I, my dad used to bring mercury home, and what do we do? We play with it all the time. <laughs> so that's probably so I can blame I can blame my absent mindedness on my mercury poisoning, right? Uh, lead, uh, lead is not uh, lead is not dangerous to handle because the molecules are bigger than your pores. Lead is bad to do what uh, to ingest, or if you've got 
if you got scut cuts on your hand, but you can handle lead. Just make sure uh, when you handle it, you make sure you wash your hands real, real good when you get through. Not don't use the disinfectant, by the way, because that just moves the molecules around, right? So that's what we used to have in our house right there. You know. So this is basically what they have. Uh, but this could be anything. I see tilt switches where they actually tilt. Uh, tilt. Uh, we can use uh, we can use uh, reed switches, magnetic reed switches, and have a magnet there. Uh, we could have Hall effect sensors and have a magnet out there that that can measure the position for us. So we have several other ways we can use besides using mercury switches. Okay. So we can use biometallic contact. So this is the sensor that no, that we normally use inside of the small motors uh, that. Uh, So most motors, over very small fractional motors, uh, has to have what we call overload sensors in them. So on uh, I was going to say on these motor starters that we use over here, y'all had y'all had. Uh, uh, you have the thermal sensor on there. Uh, this is a uh, same place motor. It's a, a three-speed motor, and Are y'all that had motor controls? Why do we call this part of the motor an AC motor? What do we call this? What do we call this whole unit right here? First of the S. We call it a stator. <laughs> the stationary part of the motor, the feel, you call it the stator. And the rotational part, you call it the motor. Uh, DC motors are different. They call the, uh, the stationary part, they call it the field, and the rotating part is the arm, you know, even though some people miss. So this guy right here, this is the little bimetallic strip. This is the thermal overload right here. So what they actually do, is they, they a current flows through the bimetallic strip. It has resistance, right? All metals have resistance. If the current gets too high, it heats up, it warps, and will open the circuit to these. Now, these uh, thermal overloads are pretty dangerous, and that will automatically reset. Which means what? Your motor's out there not working, and you go out there and turn it on. And you don't keep power, it's not really possible. Your fan motor's pretty bad now. There's a little red unit in there, so that's the biometallic strip in there. Uh, what other what are the household item uh, you think uses uh, uh, thermal thermal overload? Yeah, but those are motors, and yeah, just about every motor, uh, small motors in your house, uh, these use these biometallic strip sensors. Y'all talk about motors, <laughs> single phase motors. What besides something that has a motor on it? Where do you think? Uh, where else do we use thermal thermal sensors at? These use uh, these don't use bimetallic strips. So use, those use those use the mers the misters. Your hot water tank use don't use bimetallic strips. So use something called RDTs. We ain't got any, but good idea. Circuit breakers. So a circuit breaker usually uses a bimetallic strip. So all the current flows through the strip. If it gets too hot, what does it do? It warps the strip. So this, and then that's why when you go in there and you you try to reset it, if you don't give it time to do what, if you're in there when it pops, most of the time you can't do what. It won't reset. You have to wait for the strip to cool down. Yeah. 
this is actually an inside of a of a typical uh, circuit breaker. Spring loaded. Uh, when this thing trips, this thing bends. It causes this thing to pop out. Causes this thing to pop down. Right? Spring pushes. So. Thermocouples. Thermocouples are really cool. Thermocouples are uh, two metal conductors that joins at the end. What they do is they got to be what we call dissimilar metals. And what happens when we have these dissimilar metals, uh, they actually generate a difference of electrical potential. And the difference of electrical potential that they generate is basically proportional to the amount of heat you expose the two metals to. And we have what we call a, a junction. We have a junction where we can bring them together. Produces a, a proportional millivolt EMF when the junction is heated. So we combine them in one spot. Types of metals determine the temperature range. Uh, these, this requires two junctions. Uh, it requires what we call a, a, a hot junction, which is actually doing the measurement. And then it, require, we, it requires a reference junction, which we reference the change to. Does that make sense? Uh, what we used to do is, uh, when we first got involved with these uh, in lab, what we would do is we would take the reference junction and put it in an ice bath. So then the voltage it put out was relative to zero. So you got to make this this voltage relative to something, right? Does this make sense? Uh, anybody? Uh, I didn't bring my thermocouple. A lot of your meters uh, uh, provide thermocouples with them. Anybody got their thermocouple with their meter? Did y'all get a thermocouple with them there? You got it with you? Yeah, I'll bring it up and pass it around. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. And this is pretty standard. Uh, a lot of meters have this now. So this is the actual bonding, if I can get it in front of my camera. So see where they actually bond it together on the end right there? So that's your junction right there. And this would be the hot junction. And then the reference junction is where it's inside the meter, right? Okay. I'll pass this around with y'all. So I don't care if it's normal. By the way, the physics tells us what type of metals it is. No, no. Of course, to measure the temperature, you would act to measure the temperature something, you don't have to actually let that thing touch. Where do we use thermocouples inside our house? Probably two places. Most of y'all are familiar with one. Our one thing usually uses what we call an RDT, but if it says if it's a gas water tank, it has a thermocouple on it. Uh, the gas water tank, uh, what it does is it senses the, the pilot light. Uh, it doesn't sense the temperature of the water; it senses the pilot light. A what? Thermocouple. It tells you the temperature. Okay. Adam, Adam, what kind of phone you got? <laughs> we had a we had a uh, oh, we was over there uh, in the lab, and we had a RFDI tag, and uh, I said I don't think your phone will read it. Read it. And went, mm. so. <laughs> Your your oven your oven has a uh, a thermocouple in it uh, that and these things are pretty precise right you understand and usually your refrigerator has a thermocouple in it that it does what actually senses the temperature of of your refrigerator deeper you know. 
Uh, fast response output signal usually is in millivolts. These guys are these guys are fairly accurate. They're accurate enough to cook off of, and requires that reference junction. And of course, most of the time we, like I said, when I first got involved with them, when I was taking a physics class at college, we actually get the reference junction in I form. Uh, now, now most of your thermocouple, the, the cold junction is electronically simulated. So these are examples of thermocouples. This is the one that actually has red here, it's sort of like that. Uh, this is usually the type that you see in your, uh, if you've got gas water here, you'll see a copper tube that goes, it actually sits, the thermocouple actually sits in the frame of the pilot light. Uh, you don't want to turn on the main gas valve unless you've got, unless the pilot light is lit, right? So, uh, so different methods. Everybody okay? What's nice about these things is they don't have to be powered. They power themselves, right? You understand? Uh, so these are just different types of methods of simulating the cold junction. Uh, this is probably the method that's used. The second one is probably the method used most by most by a digital readout. Uh, the only problem we got, guys, is that. Uh, you have to maintain the metals all the way to your co to uh, to your readout, which is uh, we had a, a jet engines on the airplane that I was working on, and one of the wires broke off the thermal companies that actually is a jet engine, and uh, they call it uh, we had the inlet temperature and, and the outlet temperature that they kept up with, and one of the uh, one of the wires broke off one of the thermal couples. And we went out there. We didn't know better. And we just got a regular uh, crimp on terminal and crimped that thing on there and put it back on there. <laughs> and uh, uh, that plane was grounded for a while uh, because the, the temperature on the gauge wouldn't be right. Because what we did is we messed up the metals, right? You know what I'm we didn't maintain the metals. So they actually had to fly the plane down the Lockheed. Uh, and actually, they had to read with the engine set. Our plane could fly. It was a four-engine turboprop plane. It could fly on three engines. So they just uh, feathered the engine, feather, feathered the engine. Uh, the engines on the planes that we worked on, they ran at 100% all the time. And the way they changed the speed is they changed the pitch of the prop. And so what would they do if they were going to fly with one engine out? They feathered the engine so they'd turn the prop so it was uh, perpendicular or in line, parallel with the flow. And then the plane, uh, the props wouldn't turn out there. So they flew it, flew it down to Lockheed, and they fixed our mistake. So that means if your thermal, if your, if it breaks, guys, uh, we don't want them to twist them together. Basically, you just need to buy a new thermocouple. Uh, so this is what we're talking about: thermocouples. We have to have a uh, what we call a cold junction. This is your reference junction. Then we have what they call a hot junction. So again, we got to run these in pair. So one of them is your reference. What does this voltage mean, right? What does this voltage mean? Uh, so uh, are we okay? And usually this is transparent to you because usually when you plug it into your instrument, so this is the way it would be. Uh, it would be electronically compensated for. Well, what we know is uh, we got to have two watt, got to have two junctions. We got to have what we call a hot junction and then a cold junction, right? And the cold junction is what we reference to. Uh, this is a differential amplifier, by the way. And what a differential amplifier does is it 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 outputs the difference between this. It does math, but it gives us an analog output. What what a differential amplifier does. So, an example, this right here was at two, two volts, and this right here was at one volt, then it would output at a minus one volt, because the minus input would be one volt greater than the minus input. Thank goodness for differential on first. Uh, basically, these guys are rated in letters, and the only way you'll know it is so. If you got a K, if your if your system is using a K, you don't want to replace it with a watt, with an N, right? You need to replace it with the same way. These should be on the thermal couples. Uh, this gives you the temperature range that these guys are designed to operate in, and you can see they can operate in wide ranges. 
Uh, this guy right here can operate. Uh, I don't know what type they actually use, but uh, on the Cubot furnaces, which made steel, uh, they had a little hole in the doors, and they would slide a thermocouple down into the steel so they could actually precisely measure the temperature of the steel. So, we go long too. It was uh, interesting to watch that. If you if you haven't been around melted steel, you don't understand heat. <laughs> they had an open house out there one day, and they had the rail. They had up there, and they opened up the front. They opened up the door on the cube off, and they had about like five people pass out. <laughs> <laughs> so they said, <laughs> that's one of those things, man, we screwed up. Uh, by the way, they color code them. By, uh, they should be color coded depending on, and a lot of times, that's what I was looking on Alex. One of them I got, it actually tells you the metals uh, that you that you use. So what you don't want to do is you don't want to plug, you don't want to plug that thing. It's supposed, it should plug in. It's got a plus and a minus on it. If you plug it in backwards, it's not going to work, right? You understand? Because the voltages and everything, wouldn't, you'd have, you wouldn't have uh, the right metals together. Okay? So this guy right here, this is probably one that you have in your oven. Uh, or your. This guy will go all the way from a minus 200 degrees uh, Celsius up to 350 degrees Celsius. What you have in your oven, I'm not really sure, but it usually runs around the very top of the oven. And of course, maintaining the metals, you got to maintain the metals. And this is the problem that we had is that we uh, put, we introduced a different metal into the system before it got to the indicator, and it meant the uh, the uh, it was a turbine in, uh, turbine inlet temperature uh, where we screwed around with, and it must have had 50 thermocouples around the output. Of that thing, and they were all hooked in series eighting. So what does that mean? Yeah, the voltages each one. Of them. So I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what the voltages we got. And you see these guys. These guys are really linear, right? And linear means they vary their their output in proportion to the temperature. So these guys are pretty accurate. So and they go they go over a real wide range of temperature measurements. Thermocouples. So what does thermocouples do? They, they output a voltage that's proportional to the temperature that they're designed to measure. And we have to run them with a reference, right, so we can set what zero means. So, are we okay? Uh, this is what determines the resistance of a metal conductor? What can determine the resistance of a metal? Size, kind of metal. Somebody else say, what did you say? The length, the distance, and then the, then the, uh, uh, of metal, size of the conductor. The length, and then the last one is what we're going to use. The temperature. <laughs> Y'all settle down, guys. Y'all settle down, guys. Right. <laughs> so if we if we choose a size metal, we have a length, we have a gauge, we have a length, then we can use these guys to measure what temperature. I thought you could get that because this is what we're lecturing on is what temperature sensors. Uh, these guys are called RDTs, which stands for resistance temperature devices. Uh, this gives you the different types of metals. And they usually consist of a fine gauge wire. This is the uh, one of the temperature sensors. Uh, by the way, this is a bimetallic strip undoubtedly, but somebody broke it. Might have been me. So this is this is a bimetallic strip out here on the end, and this just operates a switch. Here's an RDT right here, and it's just a bunch of just fine wire round around something, right? You understand? And then of course, as the temperature goes up. Its resistance does what? Opposite. 
you know, metals when they're heated, their resistance goes up, and when they when it um, when they cool, their resistance goes down. That's why these supercomputers that they talk about is operated at extremely low temperatures. So these guys have P. These, these are positive temperature coefficient devices, which means their resistance goes up when the temperature goes up, right? These are consistent fine wire gauge wire wrapped around a ceramic rod. Very accurate and stable, reasonably um, wide temperature range. These guys are expensive because they got a lot of wire. You know, right? So thermocouples only got two. These guys a lot of wire uh, to make them up. Uh, thermocouples actually excite themselves. Uh, these guys require external excitation. A small change in resistance of a wide of uh, its range of operations. So these are normally what we have in our uh, in our water heaters, and that's the rods that sit in there that actually sense the temperature. Uh, whether you have a electric water heater or whether you have a gas water heater to make it Are we okay? So here's some examples of some RDTs, RTDs. So uh, this is a lot like the ones that look like in your water heater. You can leave the side if you ever take the metal cover off and take off the insulation. Thermistor. These are solid state devices. These are semiconductors. Yeah, the resistance varies with temperature. Now, the problem we have with these, these are not linear, which means uh, their resistance does not vary in a watt. Straight line. Now, these are pretty obvious what they thermistor temperature resistors, right? Uh, these guys are high. Uh, they're high sensitive. They're inexpensive. These guys cost. It depends on you know what range you run, and they're reasonably accurate, but they're reasonably accurate over a short span. So uh, these are different thermistors. Uh, so this is basically what we get. We get a curve. Uh, we have two types. So this would be what we call a. a this temperature down goes down, uh, resistance, this temperature goes up, uh, resistance goes down. So this would be what we call a, a NTC, a negative temperature. Coefficient. Uh, so we can get these either way. We can get them at what we call a PTC or NTC. What do those stand for? So on this one, as temperature goes up, resistance goes down. So this would be what we call a negative temperature coefficient. Um, so it means it goes in the opposite direction, right? Uh, PTC means they go in the same direction. That makes sense. Are we okay. Now where we where we get our linearity is is not using the not using the semester over its entire range. Uh, where we get real good re linearity is if we use these over a very narrow range. Uh, so like your house, your house uses one of these. And so if we went from here to here, then it's what? It's fairly linear, right? So well, these guys are used a lot, but they're not used for real wide range. They're used over a narrow range, like your house. So now our digital thermometers, um, our digital thermostats that most people have, you still got one of these guys with a mercury switch on it. And they're still out there. You know, a lot of people, if they've got something that works and they know how to use it, they're not going to change it, right? Uh, your newer houses are going to have digital thermostats on them. And these guys definitely use the ministers. My digital thermostat that I took out of my house when I replaced it with a newer one. This is a little tiny one. It's over in the other lab, and I forgot to bring it over. These guys are really cheap. 
They work well. They have to be externally excited, which means these, these guys bear their resistance. Uh, which means uh, if we're going to take a resistance and convert it into a voltage, then we can use the voltage divider method. You understand how that works? Yes, no? So our thermistor is basically acting like one of these, but what's changing this? You know, temperature. So uh, what I could do is I could take my output right here, right? And of course, it's t if I was using an NTC, that means as the temperature goes up, this resistance would go down, which means this voltage drop would go down, which means the voltage drop here would have to do what? Go up, according to Kirchhoff's law. Uh, if I wanted it to work the opposite way, if I wanted to make an NTC look like a, a PTC, then what we can do is we can put our thermistor up here at the top, and then I take my output off the fixed resistor. So this is where my output would be relative to common. So when this one, the resistance goes down, uh, I mean, the temperature goes down, it's uh, the temperature goes up, its resistance goes down, the voltage drop would go down, which means the voltage drop over here would have to do what? Would have to go up, right? You understand that? So it depends on where you hook it. So you can make an NTC uh, thermistor appear like it's giving you a positive, but it's not. It's just the way you hook it up. Now, if I had to establish a zero, uh, we would have to use a Wheatstone bridge. Everybody understand those? Everybody okay with Wheatstone bridges? Can we talk about that? Yeah. So we could use a, uh, we could use a Wheatstone bridge to establish a zero, right? You understand? Uh, then we could use the thermistor in one side, and then uh, use a, 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 a pot, a rheostat wire, a pot wires a rheostat, and we can zero it out uh, when we know the temperature. Are we okay? Uh, infrared, are y'all familiar with infrared? So everybody, what is infrared? It's the color that we can't see, right? But what's neat is that uh, we emit infrared. We get emit infrared. And the kind of infrared that you uh, produce is proportional to your Uh, these are non kind but they got to be an electronic instrument. They don't stand alone, so we don't have an infrared sensor. We have to combine it with other elements, right? You understand that for these things to mean anything. Uh, non contact senses by detection of infrared radiation. All objects emit, uh, emit IR light that is proportional to the temperature of the object. Accuracy depends on how much you're willing to pay for these things. And for it, of course, this is not visible to human uh, eyes. It's actually between a, a wavelength of around 710 nanometers to 100 microm uh, micrometers, which is a pretty long. Uh, Y'all understand wavelengths? Yeah. Okay. Alex does anyway. Or he's just answering. Okay. Uh, so the harder the target being measured, the shorter the wavelength. So normally lights, we, measure, we don't measure it in frequency. We measure it in the actual distance between, uh, it's basically the length of a cycle. Is that what we do that, which is pretty neat. And I'm sure they measure those instead of calculating. Effective is emitted, the energy is thermal radiation. These are non-contact, and we can actually use these to measure temperature, things that are actually in motion, which is pretty neat. So these are very, very popular now. Uh, or you'll see a cat go up there and they won't touch anything. They'll do uh, you <laughs> That's what we did. And the problem is, is when, by the time by the time, by the time you're in Buffalo, say I'm burnt, your brain knows you're being burnt uh, instantly, right? But by the time you send that pulse out to your your fingers, they do the trick. Uh, so these guys are really need a lot of techs use these where they can go out and look at tech equipment. And uh, it's protected to see how hot they do. Uh, you know. I 
I've been burned a few times, especially in electronics. So these are just some images of, uh, of infrared sensors. These are very popular right here, especially in, from mechanics and stuff like that. We used to watch them come in and measure the temperature coming out to see if these things are working. They had a, a thermometer that looks like these meat thermometers that you plug into a turkey or something, and they'd climb up on the ladder and they'd stick that thing in the vent. And, uh, they would do what? Well. They'd wait a little while and climb back up there. Now they have one. It's got a laser pointer on it. The laser is not measuring the temperature, by the way. The laser is just used to what? Uh, for aiming. You know? And they'll hit that thing and they'll know exactly what's coming out of there. Really, really nice. Solid state temperature, these guys um, normally kind of use a, a thermistor. Uh, we really don't know what's inside there that's tipping, uh, actually sensing the temperature, but it electronically compensates for the inaccuracy. These guys are extremely accurate. Uh, the two that we ran into is an LM35, uh, an LM35, and we've got some of these over there, guys. I think either LM35s or 34s. Uh, these guys measure uh, temperature. Uh, these these guys are. Uh, calibrated for the Celsius scale. And here's the factor right here. It gives you the transfer function. It's what? Can you all see that? Yeah. And these guys are in, it's got an accuracy of uh, a quarter degree centigrade. So there's nothing that's perfectly accurate, right? Um, but this would be within, tw what, 200? Um, 25, um, um, 0.25 degrees, and it can run up to a one milliamp load, which is not very much. But we can also uh, we can uh, so uh, basically uh, these guys from their uh, depends on what voltage you operated on it. Okay, uh, the actual range, but these guys can measure 55 up to 150 degrees centigrade. Uh, so, uh, 10 millivolts, well, so what, what would it give us out for 150 degrees centigrade? I'm waiting. 10 millivolts per degree, right? Yeah, 1.5 volts when it's all the way maximum. Okay. So you see these uh, things used a lot, in, and these are LM34s. These are calibrated around the Fahrenheit scale. So this gives us uh, 10 millivolts per degree Fahrenheit. And it's going to be with one, this one, one it's going to be within one degree at 77 degrees. Uh, these will go all the way up to 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, which would be what, how many volts that I get out for maximum? Ten millivolts, not thirty, probably three. Yeah, this operating. Yeah, this is what you can power it up on. You can power this thing up anywhere from five to thirty volts. Which would be interesting how we would come up with this. I need to go back and check that. Uh, so we get these in several different packages. The package we have is this guy right here. It's what we call an 8 pin dip. Uh, dip stands for anybody know what that stands for? Dip. It's not dipping tobacco. Yeah, acronym, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so if we looked at them uh, from the top, it would uh, come over, be very small. Like I said, I'll try to remember to bring it in. The pins come out the side. And you have two two spheres; they're parallel with each other, so that's why they're called dual inlines. So I think we the ones we have is in the A pin A pin dips. 
Uh, this is, uh, and you'll raise a lot of these guys, by the way. These are called operational amplifiers, and they're really neat. These guys have tons of electronics in them, but it's one of those things that they're integrated circuits, which means you don't need to know how they do what they do. All you need to know is what they did, right? So these guys, uh, we can set the gain on these things really easy. Uh, this is called the feedback resistor, RF. This is called the input resistor. So it's just a ratio. And uh, on this one, it's the output divided by the input plus one. Very simple formula. If it was, and these are what we call non-inverting amplifiers. If we brought it into the negative, it would be and then it would be what we call an inverting amplifier, which means it would give you out opposite, right? Does that make sense? Uh, so this guy here has a gain of ten. So what that means is, uh, if I my output would actually be multiplied by what? By ten. Which is pretty We call these guys operational amplifiers. Um, we got several versions of these, um, and this input. Uh, this input uh, resistance, which most people call it impedance, by the way. So what's the difference between impedance and resistance? No. So what's the difference between impedance and resistance? Anybody that's had AC already know this. Anybody had AC yet? So what's the difference between resistance and impedance? <laughs> that's like saying a transducer, right? A sensor is a transducer, but a transducer. What did Alex just say? Yeah, impedance impedance changes with frequency, and then resistance doesn't. I didn't hear that. But normally, when you get into AC circuits, just about everybody is going to call the opposition in an AC circuit. They're going to call it impedance, even though if it's not impedance. Uh, so you hear that a lot. And uh, you know, I don't know if we do impedance matching. I know we do impedance matching in the uh, in um I'll just say uh, I think that's it guys. Yep, that's it. So are there any more temperature systems out there? I'm sure they are. Uh, you know, whatever your company uh, runs. Uh, there's remember a couple couples if you replace them you need to make sure you replace them with the wall. The same time. Solid state, you need to make sure uh, I, uh, uh, and these guys are these guys can be analog, but they also can be digital. This is the so this is probably using an RDT just by the shape of it. We now, I think we got the data sheet on this, but this is our temperature sensor that we're going to be using in lab. And it has the ability we have the ability to set the span on it. So here's the actual sensor itself. As soon as I can get it. So what do we mean by the span? The range. Yeah. So what we can do is on this one is we can set a high temperature and we can set a low temperature. Uh, so what we do, it's got a lock right here, which we can unlock it. And then once we get it unlocked, we can come up here and we can adjust these bars. And then we can come up here and we can set a temperature. And I don't remember which is high and which is low. Uh, this guy here operates off of uh, 24 volts DC. All we have is 124, 120 volts. So what do you think that means? We need a power supply, yeah. Uh, so uh, this is the power supply we'll use. It's a 24 volt power supply. And we'll plug it in right here. Uh, this is a four wire sensor, which means what? means we have both normally closed and normally open contacts, right? 
Okay, we have a so, and we have a single row, a single row for each. I mean, sorry, a double row. Single, we have a, this is a double row single row, but what we have is one per 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 row. Okay. Uh, since this guy here is a DC sensor and we're doing 120 volts AC, uh, then what we have is we have two relays. Okay, everybody okay? So we have two relays. And then on the back, uh, so the, the sensor is hooked up to this guy. So if you look up the back, uh, you can actually see uh, the brown and blue and then the white and black. So brown and blue are what? Oh, you can't? Um, yeah, there we go. That's a pretty good shot, ain't it? No, except you can't really see the black. But we can see the white. You can't see the black, but blue and brown. So uh, this is our blue and brown is our power, right? Then white would be normally, it would normally be the normally closed, and the black would be the normally open. But you know, there's always that, right? What they're doing is they're bringing this up to two uh, little relays. Uh, by the way, these are uh, counter EMF diodes. Uh, what happens when we uh, de-energize a, a, a coil, it produces a real high voltage output. Uh, so these right here are in here to just uh, eliminate that counter EMF. Uh, this diode is in here in case somehow you get your power supply wired backwards. You're not going to burn your sensor up. Uh, so one of them comes over here. We'll have to figure out the white one comes to this one on this side, and then the black one comes to this one on this side. And then we have uh, terminals down here, and uh, I don't think we've got the data. There might be the data sheet on this, but we shouldn't need it because the way they're labeled, this is labeled what? N-O-C-N-C. -N -C. So what does that stand and this right here would be your common between them, right? And then we got another set over here, uh, normally open, normally closed. So you all have to figure out which one is going to be what position at what temperature and which one you're going to use. I think in our lab we only use one side, and I don't remember which side, but it's pretty easy to figure out. Uh, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to get hot water from the restroom, and we'll dip it in the hot water to see when it trails, and then. Uh, we'll get ice water from the cafeteria or uh, just go down there and get a, a glass and put some ice in it. And I think they don't, I think they got a place over there where you can just get ice, right? No, they don't anymore. Like I said, I haven't been in there since they sold it. I thought we'll probably have to get some ice somewhere. Uh, I think last class they just asked the people could they have some uh, ice for a lab. I think they love that. Uh, once you get to the temperature sensor lab, these will be uh, what we're going to do those labs on. And even though they're analog sensors, they have an AC converter built in them. And I think they got lights on that shows you when the, when the ones activate. So, any questions on temperature sensors? Okay, guys.